I'm going to, uh, I, I, was really, I was really blessed by listening to the uh, bagpipes playing across the road. So do you know that the bagpipes that, that we all identify with Scotland were actually invented in Ireland? And they were, they were. And they gave them to Scotland as a joke. <laughs> and, and the funny thing is they haven't cottoned on yet. <laughs> So, um, if I can, I'd just like to begin with prayer. So, Father, I uh, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for the beautiful sound of bagpipe music wafting across the road. And, uh, and we give thanks for this time. Lord, I just pray that uh, as I share parts of my story, uh, Lord, that it, uh, I could just reflect the, uh, the beautiful parts that are really uh, your story. And, uh, and I pray that, uh, it, um, that you would uh, um, just connect the thoughts with, with, uh, with others here in the room, that um, we, uh, we may be encouraged by your life in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so, um, so I'll, I'll begin where it begins for me. I actually, um, um, I grew up in Toronto and uh, have uh, a small family, three, uh, three boys in our family, two brothers, and uh, my mom and dad. They've uh, lived in their house now, same house for 64 years, still living there. And, uh, and uh, anyway, I, um, when I was growing up, my next door neighbor joined the, uh, uh, joined the church choir down the street. And somehow, because we were friends, I, I got invited to join that choir as well. And, uh, um, and my grandfather, who was, a, who was a pretty serious Anglican churchman and uh, loved, uh, you know, loved the, uh, uh, loved God, he, uh, he really encouraged me when I was a kid. And so at age seven, I kind of left Sunday school and I went to join the church choir. And I became a, became a boy soprano and uh, sang in several, you know, sang in several uh, church services every week and sang at a lot of weddings and got paid the mighty sum of 75 cents a month for doing all that. <laughs> and, uh, Anyway, it was uh, it, it was really it, it was really good. I got to um, to know what you do in church, but um, I didn't get very much Sunday school as a result. So, um, so anyway, uh, unfortunately, at age twelve, this happens naturally. My voice broke, and uh, I was just kind of ushered out of the choir, and somehow managed to stay in the church for another two years. And then I was, uh, uh, I, I was confirmed and um, kind of slipped out the side door of the church. And uh, it, uh, it wasn't, wasn't really intentional, but I just didn't really know my place. And so over the next few years, I had a, um, um, I really kind of explored, even though I grew up in the city, I really was exploring an interest in farming. My granddad was a farmer my grandpa, who was a Christian guy, and uh, he used to take me out in the country all the time. We'd go visiting farms, and, and uh, when, when I got to be into high school, I got this real ambition to, uh, to learn about farming, and so uh, I, I wrote letters all over Western Canada. I really had this fascination with the West, and, uh, but it turned out that my grandpa remembered that he had a first cousin who left the old country about the same time as he did, or, or, when, or before he did, and uh, he ended up in Alberta and was farming near Merthorpe. And so I wrote a letter out there, and his son wrote me back and said, yeah, I'll hire you. And so away I went that summer. I made my first big trip out to, out to the west, and, um, and for several years after that, I was, I was uh, working on this farm in, near Merthorpe, Alberta, sort of northwest of Edmonton. And, um, and it, was a real, it was a real life changer for me. I realized how much I, I loved the outdoors, I loved the farming life. I was really blessed by the family 
you know, like just seeing how the family function on a farm together, how they could really do life together. And, uh, um, and so I was also really blessed by this family because they were really um, quite, quite, uh, they were Bible-believing Christians and went to church every week. And uh, so I would go with them. And over the next several years, all those years of Sunday school that I missed all got filled in. All the blanks got filled in because I would go with them to, you know, to, uh, to Bible school or church school or Sunday school before the service. And, and it really helped me. So um, when I, when I um, <coughs> got an opportunity to go to university, I was really kind of choosing between, what well, do I want to go into agriculture? I was also really interested in forestry, and I'd spent some time working in northern Ontario. Um, uh, uh, and um, one, 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 one summer in high school. And so I, um, so I made a choice, and I opted to go for forestry. And uh, that didn't work out. I, it was okay. I got all my courses, but I, I still didn't feel that was the right path. So I went out west again to Simon Fraser, and I did a year of arts courses and started learning a little bit about other, you know, different subjects that I was sort of exploring. But I found that I was interested in economics, and. Uh, and at the end of that year, I, I transferred again, and all my courses just kept transferring as if I had just been going to the same university. And I, got, I went to the University of Guelph, where I graduated in agriculture, and specifically agricultural economics and business. And uh, so I had, a, uh, I had a really good university background. So I, to prove to you that I actually graduated, I brought my university photo. Uh, picture and uh, uh, yes, so so there's my diploma right there, and uh, I I'd, I'd had a fair amount to do with livestock, so I've got a couple of pigs on my on my lap there, and uh, and you can see that at one time I did have blonde, blonde hair, hair. <laughs> yeah, true, wow. and uh, somehow the cartoonist uh, captured the wild Irish nose profile very well. <laughs> So, um, so that was um, th that's how I, um, I I went from university to uh, back out to Western Canada to British Columbia, and I, I got involved in a uh, a very large scale hog operation in British Columbia, and um, learned a lot. Of, I learned a lot about small scale farming, but now I was learning about large scale farming, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and after a couple of years in that business, I moved out to Manitoba, still with the same, still with the same company. And at that time, I went into the feed, feed milling business. So I was learning, and uh, um, and and uh, the 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 thing that happened there was they sort of taken me right out of um, manage or just you know selling, working with. Uh, livestock, breeding stock animals and selling them. They put me into a grain and feed business and I was the general manager. So I had to really learn fast about how to, uh, how to manage things. But <clears throat> I learned a lot from my dad. My dad spent his whole life in general management work. So um, I, uh, um, so there I was out in Manitoba and I met Marlene. And so Marlene, my wife, and uh, we met at a place called the Holy Ghost Hall. Now it's kind of <laughs> prophetic because I wasn't there. I belong, wasn't there for uh, any kind of religious reason, but I was. Uh, um, it was sort of like a social, and uh, that uh, the rowing club that I belonged to was trying to raise money, and I walked into this rowing club, and uh, this uh, or into this social. And the, uh, one of the girls that I knew who rode in the afternoon said, Bob, I want to introduce you to some of the girls I work with. And she introduced me to 10 girls all at once. I thought, wow. And the last one was Marlene. And she said, oh, and Marlene has just moved here from BC. Well, I had just moved there from BC. So all of a sudden, who did I talk to? I talked to Marlene, you know. So we had instant conversation. Anyway, 
coming out of that night, I, I, uh, I asked her out the following Saturday night, and we've been going out every Saturday night since. So, so if you're ever in Winnipeg, up near the Redwood Bridge, the Holy Ghost Hall, I, re I highly recommend it. <laughs> So another thing that really that happened while I was in, in uh, it, it, you know, th through this, my first boss, who actually you know transcended between BC and going back to Manitoba, he was a uh, um, a beautiful Catholic Christian guy and uh, large family. I just I, I just fell in love with that family, you know, and uh, and I I just really appreciated, you know, his his quiet faith and how there was one occasion where I saw that, you know, his faith really sustained him through a, through something that uh, that was very very difficult, and so. Um, in my own job, I was working with a. Um, uh, with a Mennonite farmer who was setting up a, a business. And I would visit this guy every single week, and every week we'd talk business, but every week he always had this quiet witness for me. He would always say, hey, let's go have a cup of coffee. So he'd sit down and with his wife, and they would always share a little bit about their lives in Christ uh, with me. And it wasn't, it wasn't pushy, it was just, just nice. So, um, um, rolled the clock forward about a year, uh, and um, Christmas Eve, I'd still courting Marlene, really thinking about um, about uh, you know where our relationship was going. Kind of, to be honest, had cold feet. If you know what I mean? Like I'd been a bachelor for a little while, been out on my own for a few years, and it was sort of like you know, hey, what's the next step? So anyway, we were at a uh, uh, Christmas Eve party and somebody, a friend suggested, why don't we go to a candlelight service? So at the end of the party we left, we went downtown, downtown Winnipeg, and we went to this, to, to the Anglican church there and there was this beautiful, you know, sort of midnight mass that all had been set up for that evening. And uh, I can still remember the pastor coming up and getting into the pulpit and he says, he says the bells of uh, the bells of the world have drowned out the bells of the church. He says, we've lost the meaning of Christmas. He grabs the Bible and he says, he says, you've got to read this Bible, you've got to meet this man, Jesus. He's the most important one who has ever lived. He will change your life. And every time he hit the Bible, I just felt chills going through me. And, and I, the, the whole message about reading the Bible was sort of like, yeah, that's what I need to do, you know? Like, I really felt that was something that I'd been missing. So, anyway, I just made a decision sitting there, right in the middle of that sermon, that that's what I was going to do. I was going to get an easy-to-read Bible, and I was going to read it. And so I get in the car with Marlene, all excited. And so I say, what did you think of that sermon? She said, nothing. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no. So anyway, I told her about what it meant to me, and then... All of a sudden, it just opened up a whole conversation about faith between us that had not really been there before. Like, we talked about all kinds of things, almost everything, except here she was, a lapsed Lutheran, and I'm a lapsed Anglican, and all of a sudden, we're talking about this, and it was like it, we were both just coming alive in the subject. So I got home that night, and I just... I don't know, I just had tears in my eyes. I just knew I was going to become a Christian. I knew I was going to marry Marlene. I knew that we were going to have a Christian life together. And, and I, you know, you know, quite often Christmas Eve, the, the, uh, the Scrooge movie, the old, uh, you know, Alistair Sim Christmas Tale uh, was, was on. And I'm watching this and I'm just all tears, right? Just because, you know, <laughs> it's like the same thing that's happened to him is happening to me right there that evening. So, um, and when I, so at the next, you know, the next week I got a Bible. I started reading it. Within three weeks, Marlene and I were engaged and uh, we went to find a pastor. We asked him 
Um, it was her youth pastor once upon a time, and we asked him if he would help us come back into the church and prepare for marriage. So he did. So, um, but in those early days of, you know, sort of uh, having had this experience, I, I had this vision, and this vision was really powerful. It, uh, it was a vision of Jesus, and he had his arms out like this, and he was bringing all kinds of people, uh, you know, peoples from all different nations together, and all kinds of church buildings were in the mix, and those church buildings were all being crowded all together. He's bringing them all together like this, and he pulls it all up to his chest. And I've never forgot that vision, but it would have meant to me at the time is Jesus is saying, I'm bringing my church together and I'm drawing it to myself. And, and so I've always, from that time, had this real um, interest in church unity and churches coming together and Christian people coming together and being part of, you know, um, being drawn into the breast of Jesus. And uh, the other thing that happened to me at that time is I also had this sort of real sense mm -hmm. that I was going to go into full-time ministry at some time in my life. I don't know, because I, you know, when I, when I got real serious about this, I inquired of some, some uh, um, church leaders, and they kind of discouraged me. They said, no, you're, you're, you're out in management work. You, you should stay there. You should keep doing that. And... Hmm. Anyway, I I, um, I found that you know years later I was to discover that was my Christian ministry was out in the workplace in the marketplace, but I didn't believe it at the time. So um, after we had been after we'd been in um, you know Marlene and I got married about eight years later we moved to Ireland, and um, this was really just this was. We'd gone to Ireland on lots of two-week holidays. My family still maintained its memory of their, of their Irish, of its Irish roots. And uh, so we reconnected with our old family over there. And, uh, and we moved out into the country a couple of kilometers away from um, where my family originally was located and where there were still cousins. And, uh, Anyway, we just loved it. We, we were just really excited about it. Bought a car so we had independence to go around. And, and um, one day we decided that we wanted to invite our, uh, our Irish cousins over for supper because they were always having us over for supper, right? So we said, well, we're going to make, a, uh, gonna make we, uh, a spaghetti dinner on Saturday night and we'd like you to come. Well, they were country people. They never had spaghetti dinner before, you know, they didn't know what that was. So they, they, they just inquired, they said, well, will there be potatoes on the table? <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah, sure. So anyway, so we made a big bowl of potatoes on the table and uh, that, that fixed everything. They were good with that, you know, you have spaghetti, as long as they had potatoes too. He said, it wouldn't feel like we'd had a meal unless we'd had potatoes. <laughs> So the, uh, one of the cutest things, our boys were small. They were two and five when we were there. They turned those ages. And uh, our five-year-old was playing with all the little kids in the town land. Like he, he got to know them really well and he'd always be out with them. And he not only picked up an Irish brogue after about a couple of months, it was solid, uh, but he also used the, the Irish dialect or he used the local Donegal dialect. And so, uh, um, you know, he'd, he'd say things like, uh, uh, Dad, I'm going out to play with Alan in the shock. I am, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, what's a shock, right? <laughs> <laughs> so one day, we're making dinner together, and Jimmy and I work out this little routine. And he goes like this, he says, My name is Jimmy Cheatley, I come from Donegal. I'd say, and do you like potatoes, Jim? I licks them big and small. <laughs> and how does he eat them? I eat some skins and all. And do the skins not choke you? No, oh, they don't. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
another thing that happened while we were in Ireland, we just kept meeting these really interesting spirit-filled Christians. Like they belonged to mainline churches like Presbyterian churches, Catholic churches, and um, but they were there was something different about them. And uh, and so I can remember Marlene saying, you know, there's there's something about this. We keep meeting these interesting people, and uh, th this isn't by accident. So anyway, after after uh, after we finished our uh, about six months living in Ireland, we, we went and we did a visit down in New Zealand for several months, and and uh, and then we came back to Canada. We decided to move back to BC. And when we moved to BC, we, we landed in a, a wonderful church where we really grew as Christians. You know, I, um, you know, job-wise, things weren't so great out there. I ended up having a couple of jobs, sort of kept things going. But, uh, but our real experience out there was, was, um, uh, was you know, really, in the, in the six years that we were there, we really just grew a lot. And uh, we were in a beautiful community. Um, it was a, a, an Anglican church that at one time had had a charismatic renewal. And some of the life of that was still carrying on. And, uh, and I think we were really touched by it. I think we had some really powerful um, encounters with God out there. So then one day I'm flipping through the Globe and Mail and I spy this job. They're looking for a general manager to run a salmon food business in St. Andrews, New Brunswick. I don't know why. I seem pretty happy out there, but I just thought, that's really interesting, you know? So I cut it out of the paper, took it, uh, took it, uh, took, made, made a couple of phone calls, ended up writing a, uh, writing a, a resume up, and, uh, Next thing I know, um, I was got, I was interviewed, and and then uh, we, were, we were planning to come here to New Brunswick. I had never thought in the wildest imagination that I would ever be here in the Maritimes. You know, when you go when you study agriculture, you're likely to be in Ontario or the Prairies or something like that. Well, here I am now, going to make salmon food for uh, fish in out here. So when, when we were moving out, I got a referral from this Anglican priest. He said, well, when you go out there, Bob, you got to meet these two but pals of his. He was originally from the Maritimes, so he gave me the names of a couple of Anglican priests. They were easy to find. And also the name of a guy named Don Cantell, who was the founding president of St. Stephen's University. So I came, uh, 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 came here to, to town. Um, called the university and they said, no, Don Cantel is over in Europe. Well, he was leading the Europe trip. And uh, so I, um, um, that fall, um, there was a girl who graduated from SSU named Kara Thompson, and she was being sent out as a missionary to South America. And so I went to the luncheon where she was being, where she was being sent, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, sent out, and and it was there that I met Don Cantell. So we sort of developed a bit of a friendship. He invited me to uh, uh, visit the university, and uh, one thing led to another. And the next thing you know, I was I was invited to join the board of the university. So in total, I was on the board for six years, and. Uh, and during that time, I had this job working in, uh, in St. Andrews that caused me to travel a great deal. Like the company that, that I joined was actually formed in Europe. And so I had to go back to Europe quite a bit. And my, but my boss was in Vancouver, so I was always going back to Van Vancouver. And, uh, and uh, that was our Canadian head office. And so, I always felt like I was sort of jet lagged, you know, four hours out of time zone, traveling too much. But um, somehow it all worked. Our family sort of held together through uh, through that. I'd say it was the most fun job I've ever had. Uh, it was really, it was really interesting. I developed. I love partnerships. I developed a partnership over in Ireland. I found myself traveling to Ireland quite quite often to uh, work with them, and we had. Uh, 
So six years later, the, the salmon industry is totally different. Things have changed. My job is disappearing. And, um, and so the day that I called, uh, uh, I called Peter Fitch, who had become a very close friend, and uh, I said, Pete, I said, you know, my job's disappearing. I uh, just want you to know, well, Peter just got in the car, drove straight down, and, and we spent the afternoon together, and, and uh, he says, well, not so bad. Maybe you're being turned out to pastor. <laughs> I think he likes puns, you know. But um, anyway, I, I thought, well, okay, that's, that's interesting thought. So I thought about that. Well, then, then um, the next day Marlene and I went for a walk. And uh, when we got home, the answer phone was blinking, so I, I clicked on it. And it was a, a ministry out in Winnipeg that, you know, we had supported um, for several years. And uh, somebody had phoned the house and left a message. And um, the message was, hi, Bob, uh, this is, it's a new day calling from uh, Winnipeg. And... Um, we want to thank you for your support of our ministry, but mostly we're calling just to tell you that uh, um, uh, that you should that that um, God really wants you to know that He loves you and that He is um, He cares about your uh, your situation. He knows exactly what's going on in your life right now, and uh, He is He is always with you and He is there for you and. Uh, and that was it. Thanks for calling. Didn't know I ask or anything. And so I, I thought about that. I thought, well, okay, maybe that person was reading from a script, but that's the script I needed to hear that day, you know? I just needed to hear that God knows what's going on so, so I could just trust in it. And, uh, and then, what, you know, I, I, I really felt that that, that uh, that God was calling me to this work. And uh, one thing led to another. I ended up uh, uh, deciding to, instead of, uh, I'd like to uh, go back to school. And so that fall I went into the ministry program and uh, spent the year um, with, uh, the ministry program used to be a residential program here. And, uh, and it, was, it was an absolutely wonderful year. And during that year, the board and the faculty, uh, there, were, there were discussions and asked if I would be interested in, um, in doing the job of president because Don had retired. And, uh, and so I, um, I, I had a, a covert meeting with the faculty. And I said to them, I said, you know, I feel called to this, but I don't want to. I don't want to mess up my year as a student. So if you will just put it right out of your mind and forget all about it, I'll, you know, I'll plan to come here and and do this work. But I said, just, just, just keep it a secret. <laughs> and so the faculty agreed, and God bless them. To their credit, not a word was mentioned. We just, it's like we just all forgot about it. And I went back to. To being a student, and you know, and I would, they would put red writing all over my essays and <laughs> tell me where I was going wrong, and and uh, I had a wonderful year. And at the end of that year, I graduated, and uh, and then uh, a month later, I started I started work here as president. So from the from the first time that we moved here to St. Ed to St. Andrew St. Stephen which is now 20 years ago, um, and I got introduced to SSU, I found that I was always most attracted um, by the interesting students that were here at SSU. Um, they came from all across the country, and uh, they, they all had unique journeys. I, uh, I was one of the nearest board members to, uh, uh, to the university, so I got to meet Lots of students. I would come up for lunch sometimes. I would go to join for chapels like this. And uh, anyway, I just, I just love the students. And I would say that today, you know, all these years later, uh, I love my job more than I ever have. And I love 
the students more than I ever have. You know, like I just am so encouraged by the students that are coming here today. I just have such hope for the future, not only of the university, but you know, the uh, the church and our world. You know, I just feel it. I just feel that this is um, this is. This is a, a beautiful time that we're in, and so I would, you know, like I would say to all of you students that I really believe that you are in absolutely the right place. You're exactly where you should be. God doesn't, you know, if I, as I tell my story, I think of all these ways that I was prepared for what God wanted me to do today. And, um, and I just think that, that no one is here by accident. You have all been called, um, that you've been prepared by the, your different journeys that have brought you here. And, uh, and when the time is right for, uh, for you to move onward, God will have a plan for you too. But let me, let me just tell you a story. When I was in uh, Ireland, uh, um, when I was doing business in Ireland, I, I, I developed a partnership with this company in Westport, uh, which is on the west coast. And I arrived there at uh, uh, late, sort of like early evening, and I drove into the town, drove over the canal, parked my car on the left side of the road, and then I looked around and I saw this older gentleman there, and I said, Sir, I said, I'm looking for Doolin's Hotel. Can you show me how to get there? And this old fellow looked at me and he says, I can and I will. <laughs> he says, go ye down the road here about 200 yards and take the first turning on the right. Then go up the hill about 200 yards till you come to the post office. Mm -hmm. At the post office, turn right and come along 200 yards until you come to the church. Now at the church, you turn right and you come down 200. I said, wait a second, hold on. If I go uh, this way and up the hill and over and back, I'll be right where I am standing right now. He says, that's right, and Doolin's Hotel is right there across the street. <laughs> so what I learned from that is that sometimes you're right where you should be, and it's not bad to take a little tour of the neighborhood, but you are here, and I was there for perfect reason, you know? So I um, just want to encourage you uh, in that, and also say that, um, that uh, you know, one of the things that I think is very beautiful here at SSU is that when people are changing in their lives, like, you know, they're either graduating and getting ready to go onward, or there's, there's something new is developing. Um, SSU has got a beautiful charism for prayer discernment, you know, where somebody can say, I've got this question in my life, should I do this, should I, you know, and um, you can call a group of, of us around you to uh, listen to you, and then, and then listen. Then we will listen to God with you, and then pray with you, um, and share share the uh, you know share the things that God reveals. And uh, I've seen these things happen. I ex I've experienced it myself, where someone can someone will sit down and they will with you know scribe what each person has seen, every person who has been in that prayer discernment process, and scribe it all down, and then present it almost as a composite and is so helpful for making decisions or discerning, you know, how to go forward. So I think you can you can be here knowing you're in exactly where you should, where you're meant to be. You can trust that that uh, God is going to use this time for your your personal growth. And then when it's time to go forward, that there there is a process to help you, you know, as you make as you make choices, but that God will place you in the next place very strategically because he needs each and every one of us to uh, uh, be his representatives in the places that he's calling us to. And he'll prepare you for those assignments. So, 
that's my story and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for listening. And uh, anybody have a question? Did that really happen? The hotel story? Yeah. Really? <laughs> 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 when I grew up, I learned a lot of uh, Irish jokes, right? Because my grandmother used to tell them all the time. She used to tell these patent life jokes and things like this. And, and, um, um, and those were the only jokes that we were ever allowed to tell. Because, you know, they used to say, you can't make fun of the Polish kids down the street. You make fun of them. You know, we make fun of ourselves. And that was the rule. So. <laughs> Tell a joke. Hmm? Tell us one of the jokes. I just did. <laughs> What's on the so, other uh, picture frame? What's this? That the other picture frame. Oh, this. Oh, it's a clock. Okay. <laughs> I, I was gonna set this uh, set the clock to wake you all up. You know, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, anyway, well, thank you all for coming, and um, I will certainly have more Irish jokes for, for, uh, for, for the future. <laughs> if I uh, uh, used to be good when I traveled on business, I'd go back there and you'd always hear new ones, right? <laughs> so, uh, kind of refresh my supply. <laughs> Maybe on occasion I'll have to see if you have a lunchtime joke. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Try to spread them out. Spread them out, <laughs> right, right. Sure. Oh, lunchtime jokes would be really good. Yeah. 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 Just give me a little bit of warning. I like jokes to be kind of appropriate to the <laughs> situation, not just, you know, because I remember, I remember being at the Vineyard Church one time and, uh, Aaron, uh, one, one of our graduates uh, from here, um, was, was preaching and something went wrong with the overhead and uh, he said, uh, hey Bob, uh, I've got a gap here, tell a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Which I didn't mind at all. <laughs> but yeah, it's sort of, the, if, if I have a little bit of forethought, I'd, I, I often, if I'm asked to do a, a talk or a sermon, I'll try and weave them in somehow, <laughs> carefully, you know, appropriately. Like a story from hotel. Low end. Just catch it on. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, so much for sharing.